Okay, so we're gonna what what I want to do since we have this week and next week before we really go on August uh, break and go back to Israel. Thank God. Um, it's where tonight starts the the nine days, and next week Tuesday is going to be erev erev Tishabov. erev erev Tishabov. but it's just like a lousy feeling all around. You just kind of and, and and one of the things that we're always concerned about during the nine days. It's not, of course, there's mourning, but there's also the notion of sakana, of danger. The, like, the reason we don't swim or the reason we don't take leisure trips is because we're worried about danger. We worry about bad things happening. And we always hear, unfortunately, we hear stories of like horrible things happening during the nine days. So I thought it's appropriate. And, and the, the, the I did it on, on the Shabbos year, but I'm, I think it's appropriate as well that during the cycle of Daf Yomi, which we're in right now, we're learning Masechet Gitin which deals a lot with, mainly with divorce. So I'm not going to talk about that. But in the, in Daf Nun Vav, Nun He and Nun Vav and Nun Zion, so the, it's known as what's called the Tisha B'Av Gemaras. So when a person is in mourning, Lo Aleinu, let's say a person is in Shiva, then the Halacha says that you're not allowed to study Torah. There are a lot of things you're not allowed to do. You know, you sit on a low chair and you don't wear leather shoes and all this. Uh, but one of the lesser known things is that we don't, we don't study Torah. Why? Because it says the Torah brings you simcha. No, I'm sure a lot of people may not necessarily agree with that, but <laughs> I, I agree. I think Torah brings a tremendous amount of simcha. And so what you're allowed to learn, though, you're allowed to learn things that apply to the laws of mourning or things that are sad. And one of the things, so the, so the same law applies on Tisha B'av. On Tisha B'av, also, you're not allowed to just learn Torah. You can't do daf yomi on Tisha B'av. Unless it would fall out like this, but we have so therefore we have what's known as Tisha B'av Gemara. So the Gemara, for some reason, took a you know a side turn, which is not uncommon in the Gemara to go what's called a Gadata into an Agadic portion, a storytelling sort of portion of the Gemara, and tell us episodes related to the events leading up to and including Tisha B'av. So it's important. So these, that's why these are known as the Tisha B'av Gemaras. And as luck, luck, when Ramey Shapiro designed the the Dafayomi, so often the cycle of the learning lines up with the calendar. So we're in the three weeks now. We just had this last week and we're talking about Chorban Beis HaMikdash and to have these Gemaras during that period is extremely meaningful. So nothing is a coincidence. So I'm going to, I'll share it on my screen here and let's put this, let's tell me if you see it. You see it? Yeah. Okay. So here's what, so th this, so I just copied this out of the, uh, out of the art scroll um, Gemara. And it's going to start here where it says 55B4. You have that on your page? So the staple should be on the right side. Okay, top right. So on the on, on, there's two columns here. Just to, just to let you understand how this works, um, there's two columns always. This is the English translation. So it takes the regular page of the Gemara, and it takes a few English pages to go through each Hebrew page because there's a lot there. And it just follows along this way. So it has the Hebrew phrase, followed by the English mm -hmm. phrase, and then there are some notes on the bottom. May or may not look at some of these notes, but anyway, let's look at this. And this is a uh, extremely, extremely important Gemara. And I think especially for what's going on right now, uh, I, I think about Israel because, uh, you know, as I mentioned on Shabbos, you know, the, the Israel's going through a really, really rough time right now. Again, forget about what you think about specific issues, but just the general feeling um, on the ground is just very tense. It's really tense. It's interesting because it's never like that in Israel. Uh, it depends. It depends. There have been moments, nothing, probably nothing as dramatic as this, where so many people are drawn into it. Uh, you know, I was just talking to my daughter. She said that in her office, and you know, she's working, she's doing an internship this summer. But in her office, there are just day, a day like today, which is called a day of disruption, that you know, half the office just doesn't come to work. No, mm -hmm. couldn't get to work. Because they can't, because they can't. She, she couldn't. Yeah, they just you can't get there, you know. And so, and realizing that people, when we had roads, train stations, airports. Oh. Yeah, they closed, they closed, they closed the, the main train stations in Tel Aviv today. And and what, what I don't realize is that some people have, and they, they had a big, at the airport, our group, we had people trying to get home and they got disrupted at the airport. They almost didn't make their flights mm -hmm. because they couldn't get in the, getting in the airport. So, um, I mean, it's 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 really, but that's just a part of the thing. But the feeling, the pulse, and you speak to the average person, and they have very very strong feelings about what's happening. And part of what the way I see it is that, 
you know, what is American Jewry's role in this? So there's one school of thought that says like, it's none of your business, stay out of it. This is, this is uh, uh, internal domestic politics. What do you have to say about that? Okay, I, I understand that. Uh, but at the same time, when I see our people being torn apart, that's something that is not internal domestic politics. That's Judaism. And that's something that we can't, we can't uh, stand idly by. And a lot of that plays in this Gemara. And which I've been working a lot the last few months where, wherever I can, like spending two weeks in Israel just now was not vacation. It was just sitting with many, many different types of groups trying to get people to sit together and just see that, you know, there is the other, that there are people that disagree with you and we could still sit in the same room and we don't have to, you know, burn each other down. So that's, that's why this Gemara is extremely, extremely important. Um, and I think that that work is very valuable. And I don't want it to be said that, and you'll see based on the line in this Gemara, I don't want it to be said that when everything goes, is said and done, if that ever happens, that we, you know, we stood by idly. We should never sit idly by. Um, but there's a lot to talk about here. So let's let's look at the story. So the, the Gemara says um, here. So it's in the right column. It's You see where there's a break in the paragraph having mentioned? So go down uh, one more paragraph. It says, Akamsa uber kamsa chor of Yushalayim. You have it? You have the place there? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Akamsa Obarkamsa Harvu Shalayim. So this is a very, very strong statement to start. So the Gemara first gives a, a, a topic sense. It says three things. Akamsa Barkamsa Harvu Shalayim, Artanagol of Tarnagolta, Chor of Turmalka, and Ashka the Rispak Chor of Betar. That there was an incident involving Kamsa and Bar Kamsa that destroyed Jerusalem. The result involving a rooster and a hen that destroyed Harmelech or Har Hamelech. And the result of the incident involving the side of a carriage that Betar was destroyed. Okay, Jerusalem, we know. Har HaMelech, not so much. But Betar, of course, Betar, which is, an, is, is a direct result of the Chorban Beis HaMikdash, just, just to put it in, in historical context. Um, the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed in the year 70 of the Common Era. And Betar was the last stronghold. When you talk about uh, Bar Kokhba rebellion and Rabbi Akiva, et cetera, et cetera. So Betar was destroyed around the year 135 of the Common Era. And we actually have a special bracha that we recite in benching, when and if we bench, that the fourth blessing in benching, Hatova Hametiv, the Gemara Brachos tells us, was instituted for Haruge Betar. I'm not talking about a soccer team in Jerusalem, okay? I'm talking about... <laughs> I'm talking about uh, this place of Beitar now. This is the Beit, like so. For instance, if you go to Beitar Elite, which is just south of Yerushalayim, on the way to the Gush, uh, it's one of the largest. It's called the settlement. But trust me, like if we would give it to the Arabs, they would want, like keep it. We don't want it, okay? Because there's like 900 million Haredim living there. Uh, it's one of the fastest growing towns in all of Israel. Actually, they won the municipality award for best municipality in Israel a number of years running when it first opened. I know that my sister used to live there. Big, big, big neighborhood. But in that area, if you talk about the whole Masada story and all this, so the last stronghold, and then finally what happened was is that the Romans came and killed them all. And the Gemara goes into grave detail about well, how they were all killed, but they were not allowed to, they didn't have access to have proper burial for about three years. So therefore the bracha was instituted in benching. Why it's in benching is a whole other story, but it's in benching to commemorate two distinct miracles. We say hatov shelo hasrichu v'hametiv shenitim l'kvur as Yisrael. That the tov, the first good is that the bodies did not decompose. And the second good is that they were able to be buried with proper Jewish burial. So that's the story of Betar. Anyway, so you have here <laughs> a broad encompassing um, historical sort of snapshot here in the Gemara, in one line of the Gemara. But we're going to focus on the first part. Kamsa bar kamsa chav Now, if you would ask anybody right now, we're, we're in the three weeks, it's going to be Shabbos Chazon this week, okay? It's the saddest Shabbos of the year. So you would ask, I don't know, if, if you have if you have children around, right? It's the weirdest thing. We have one kid home. It's the weirdest, like, I don't know what to do with her. It's, the, it's so bizarre. We don't like don't know what to do with ourselves. It's really, I'm so happy though that my daughter in camp, she's, she had her day off, so she came home today. So she surprised us. Um, but like having just my wife and I and this little boy, we're like, can't somebody like take him? Somebody I'll take him. like for the summer. Yeah, he's he's <laughs> and he all he does is remind us that it's his birthday. Which is what? This week, his birthday. So he's like, you know, you know, I have a lot of, you know, I, I have my wish list on Amazon. I'm like, okay, thank you. Thank you for reminding me 90, 90 times a day. Anyway, so um 
What? No, then he got that. <laughs> got rid of that. So very good. So if you would ask, if you would, if, if I would ask my son, okay, why, why was the base I make this destroyed? Okay, so pretend you're going to be eight years old on Thursday. Okay, so what would you answer? Why was the base I make this destroyed? So he would say people hated each other. Right, and and I would say, and who destroyed it? Right. So this mostly when we talk here, we talk about the second base on Mikdash. We say the Romans. Okay. So the Gemara says, no, 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 no. It's a Kamsa or Kamsa. That there's because of this guy named Kamsa and another guy named Bar Kamsa, that's why Jerusalem was destroyed. So anything you know, just wait. So now it piques your interest. You're like, okay, let's see what's happening here. So here's the story. Dahu Gavra. Now, this is just this is just great. This is priceless because it doesn't get better than this. Now, don't ask me whether this story really happened or not. I don't know, but the point is it's probably irrelevant whether it happened or not. So you have a certain man, his best friend, I'm being very dramatic here. His best friend is named Kamsa, and his worst enemy is named Bar Kamsa. Oh, so what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> like nothing good is going to happen when you have a story that starts like that, right? Um, names that sound alike, that uh, one you love, one you hate. Oh, man. So here's what happens. Ovad Sudasa, he makes a party. Amalei mm -hmm. so he tells his right-hand man, he tells his attendant, okay? Zil Aisili Kamsa, bring an invitation to Kamsa that he should come to the party. Now, you know, it's very hard to find good help these days. So what do you think happens? So Azal Aisile Bar, okay, the next page has a very little print on the page. He brings Bar Kamtsa. So the idiot attendant, we're going to call him that, the idiot messenger or the idiot Uber Eats delivery guy, <laughs> Uber uh, invitations, um, he gives it to the wrong guy. Now, it's one thing if you give it to the wrong person, but if you give it to the arch enemy as opposed to the best friend, that's really striking. Now, but so, so what, just looking, before we do anything, what strikes right here, right here? What jumps off at you right here? Does anything. Why would he want to stay if his, if it's his enemy? Like, well, before we get to the party, before we get to the party, just an introduction that there's a mixed up invitation. He invites the wrong guy and these are their names. That what? Fine line. Uh, a fine line. Yeah. Um, oh, Dean is here. Um, yeah, there's a fine line. That's true. That's true. But look at their names. Right. And why would Bar Kamsa even want to go if he was his enemy? Well, I don't know. Think about it. Think about it. Maybe. Maybe. Um, maybe he thought. Right, you have so no enemy. All right, correct. You, you, I clearly have no. You don't know what it's like to have an enemy because you're such a sweet person, right? So it'd be impossible for anybody to, to be an enemy of yours. But imagine, try to try to put yourself in the position of someone that you know, of having somebody not like you. I'm well familiar with that position of having somebody not like me. Okay, that's like comes with the territory. I'm I'm, I'm well familiar with that. But and if somebody invites me and says, you know what, maybe they're turning over a new leaf. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe they want to, they want to make nice. That's so nice. You know what? Wow. I'm touched. Okay. What's what, what the first thing that jumps off the page to me is the names. First of all, what does the word bar mean? Then son. So the Marshall actually suggests this, that you're talking about a father and a son, a Kamsa and a bar Kamsa. You have a father and a son, and it's possible that, this friend loves one of them, hates, hate, loves the father, hates the son. Okay. Or if you want to look at it the way some Chazal explained this, the word bar in, in Aramaic, when we say uh, all these, levar mitlas, levar means to exclude. Bar means to exclude. So bar is also an exclusion, meaning this is an exclusionary tale. This is a tale about exclusion. Um, when you look at the Rambam, the Rambam writes, and we, we learned it when we did our Pnei Alach on this uh, a few months ago, but who are the first people you're supposed to invite to a simcha? Hmm? No, there's a lot of people you went there. And the Rambam says the, the people, the first people you're supposed to, you're supposed to invite the poor people, the people that nobody thinks about, the Almana, the Yasom, things like that. 
the people that you you know like they don't want them there but that's that's who you're supposed to invite first so th th this is a, about an exclusionary tale of oh here's who i'm inviting here's who i'm not inviting okay if it's if it's father and son and father is the one that you love like automatically if i didn't like your son you hate me so th there you go right right so maybe the father doesn't like the son either which is hold on to that thought because that's that's very uh y you will you have inadvertently answered the number one question of the whole story so great thanks for coming i'll see everybody next week okay <laughs> that's good okay so so okay this is the way it happens so also ashkechei the have yosef so his guy he makes a party he comes to the party Woo! Yeah, yeah, they gotta greet the guests. I gotta see everybody. On Malay, he says to Barkamsa, right? And he sees Barkamsa sitting there. He says, Look, that man, you, you're my enemy. My boy is Hocha. What are you doing here? What business do you have being here? Now, again, there, there are different approaches. We've, we have all Baruch Hashem made simchas, right? Everybody's here made a simcha. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, the worst the worst feeling of a simcha is like there's something that you just really forgot to invite or whatever, you know, it happens, it happens. Okay, we're all human. But um, has it ever happened that you had somebody that you didn't invite or you didn't want there and that showed up? It could happen, it could happen. Mm -hmm. It could happen. I used to have, uh, you know, one, one of the major issues that we have to deal with is Mishulachim. Mishulachim, people that come collecting money and they come to shul. So I have a whole set of rules on how we handle them here in the shul, et cetera, et cetera. But years and years ago, when I was making one of the, like a simchat bat for one of our daughters, I don't remember which one, because we did a bunch of them, Baruch Hashem. And it was a Sunday morning and I was outside greeting all the guests and these two guys come up and it's a whole racket and that's why I don't trust half of them. And that's a story for another time. And, and I said, I'm sorry, this is not a good time. That is a private party right now. Just, you know, this is not a good time to like to be soliciting. And he's like, no, 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 no. The rabbi told me I should come today. And you all have a This is why I have a lot of issues. I have a lot of trust issues. Maybe I have trust issues in general, but we could you know, like peel the layers back on that later. So he's, so if you see, but if you see somebody like, I didn't invite him. You're going to throw a guy out? Or are you going to just like look the other way? Mm -hmm. sit quietly or you know so, so so this guy goes out of his way and by the way notice we don't know his name okay we don't know his name we only know a kamta we know a bar kamta and we know a nameless idiot messenger and nameless host four people in the story th thus far okay and he says my boy is Ocha. so bar kamta he says it's like, I'm already here. All right, I get it. Mistakes happen. I thought maybe you were trying to be yeah. nice to me. But mistakes happen. Um, just, just let me stay. I'll tell you what. I'll even pay. You worried about the outlay because I'm an uninvited guest. I'll pay for my portion. Not an unreasonable request, okay? So Bar Kamsa comes off at this point coming as a decent fellow who, through no fault of his own, ends up at this party. He's being, sort of a scene is being created and this person is like making a stir, making a ruckus and a do, a kerfuffle, whatever you want to call it, okay? And he is making a scene. He's like, Shh, just leave me alone. Let me stay. I don't want to, don't embarrass me. I'll pay for my part and we'll go on a merry ways, okay? I get it, it was a mistake. Let's, let's live with it. The response is as follows. Next page. You can see the little copies of my thumb on the side. Um, Amal, 56A, Amale, lo, no, you cannot stay. So Barkamsa then says, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll pay for half the party. Half the party. Just let me stay. Hmm? Right? But wait, there's more. Amale, lo, he says, no. I'll pay for the whole part. Are you kidding me? If someone wants to pay for my whole simcha, forget it. I'll invite you and your whole family, right? <laughs> but he says, no. So sometimes when you, the power of, of hate mm -hmm. 
the power of contempt is so much stronger than the power of compassion or letting things go. And it's, it's, it's anytime you have some sort of sikhsuch, any kind of disagreement between people, and the hardest thing is getting people to let go of certain things. And we get it, we understand it, we've all been wronged. And so we just want to be right. Or we just want to, I'm going to get that person. I'm going to show them. I'm going to, I'm going to, I say I say it to couples all the time when I have to talk to when I'm marrying couples and I and I'm insistent that we do the halachic prenuptial agreement. Okay, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but if not, you should. And I think it's extremely important. And you know, sometimes they actually read it. <laughs> A lot of times they don't. And sometimes if they don't, they sign it, which is fine. But if they if they sometimes they don't read it, and then like the week before, like what the heck is this? I'm like, I gave you six months to to read this. Like, show it to your lawyers. And they're like, well, I'm not. Uh. So then we have to like. But I say to people, I said, you know, it seems very awkward that we should be talking about divorce when you're at a time of your marriage and you're in the happiest time. You just got engaged and preparing. And say, I said, but, and I asked them, how many of you have friends who are married? Okay. How many of you have friends that are already divorced? You'd be surprised. It's the reality of life. People get divorced. And I said that, you know what, as much as people love each other now, just multiply that by like, I don't know, a zillion. And that's when the hate that comes in when people get divorced. So, and that's the Paris. So as much goodwill as you feel right now, you could have that tenfold, the hundredfold when it comes to the lack of goodwill. And therefore we don't want to avoid these situations. So this is why we do something like this now. Okay, that's just, just a, as an example. So here, guys turning down a mega offer, pay for the party. And I'm sure it was some party. And why? Just because I would rather hate this person than kind of like put my own whatever it is that I'm dealing with aside and just let it go. Okay. So he says, I want to pay for the whole meal. And he says, no. Omale, he said, no. Nakte biade v'ukmi vavke. So now, in very public fashion, he picks him up and he throws him out of the party. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, at this point, at this point in time, okay, who's at fault? We have four parties involved here. Well, yeah. Right. No, okay, so that's one. The idiot, idiot messenger. All of them. Idiot messenger. Host. Who's all of them? All four of them. They're their responsibility. Okay, why? Tell me, tell me what what is this what did bar comps do wrong? At this point in the story. I would have left at that point. He wasn't wanted. Okay, but he, did, he, did, he, did he say anything inappropriate? No. Did he do anything inappropriate? No. Did he offer to pay his... Yeah. Okay. You think maybe he pushed too much? Yeah. Thou wanted. doth protest too much? Right. He, he, he wasn't, wasn't wanted, wanted there wasn't wanted. and he was insisting. Okay. Okay. So maybe there's a little... Okay, I hear. But the number one question of the whole story which is Aline's brilliant answer that she gave before we even asked the question was, is what? What about Kamsa? Kamsa's not even in the story. All he did was have someone mix up his name for someone else. Was he at the party? Could be, could be. He was, if he's such a close friend, he doesn't need an invitation. Maybe he came anyway, um, which some suggest we'll see. But in other words, the number of the looming question of the story is the Gemara says because of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, Jerusalem was destroyed. Now, I understand if you want to give what we call a Balabatish terror, is oh, because of the incident of surrounding the name mix up between Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, because of that incident, that's why Jerusalem was, 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 was destroyed. But the Gemara is usually very specific in the wording. It should say because of Bar Kamsa, Jerusalem was destroyed. Now, Bar Kamsa looking relatively innocent at this point. But wait, it gets better, okay? Because okay. you read ahead. You see that, what happens? See? Because a mind is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> oh, so look what happens. Um, so Barakamsa yeah. says, Omar, he says to himself, now this is the, the this is, now we're going to throw some more people into the mix, more people into trouble here. Oh, <laughs> You know what? There's a whole episode going on. There's a big, big to do at this party. And who's sitting there at the dais? All the rabbis. And the rabbis, what they do? They like, you know, they bury their face in the soup. Yeah. They were eating sushi. <laughs> they didn't say anything. And they didn't do anything. They didn't protest at all. So the fact that they didn't say anything must be 
that they didn't care. It's this line, by the way, which motivates me to say, like, you know what? After 120, people say, why don't you try to bring Jews together in a time like this in Israel? Trying, still trying. But why? Why? You can't, no, I don't want anybody to say that, you know, you sat idly by. Now, in general, and I can just tell you this from personal experience and professional experience, it's hard to know when to like jump in and when to not jump in. You know, um, the Jews' favorite pastime is pointing out when another Jew does something wrong. We love that. Like, you ever see a guy make a mistake in leaning? And the guy from like 25 rows back who's sleeping the whole time and he just jumps up. No, it's it's not it. You know, like that. Like it's <laughs> you're right. So we love we love when 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 Jews do things wrong. But at the same time, there's a way to give to there's a way to say something. And just because maybe uh you don't see the rabbis doing something um sort of in a very immediate fashion, that doesn't mean that it's not taking place privately behind the scenes or whatnot. Okay. Um you know, I'll I'll give you a, a an example that you know applies to our community. This area it's going to be out there. It's going to be viewed by tens of people. Um, there was a certain incident recently in our community with a certain um, local kosher business that got itself involved in a certain controversy. Okay, let's let's put it that way. Okay, now we take a lot of pride in our Jewish institutions. Okay, so now you know what I'm talking about. If not, don't worry, don't waste your time. Now, if you think that I and other rabbis weren't like behind the scenes trying to fix this before it got into something stupid, then you're wrong. We were. We don't need to make a statement about it. We need to go out and say, oh, yeah. we're certainly not making any public statements about it because nothing good comes of public statements, as you may well have seen on some other sides of the spectrum of what happened there and something makes national and international news that's not a good thing i need to be in israel and people reading these like jta articles and saying wait isn't that like near you i'm like yeah, that's exactly where i live okay <laughs> um and you know certain parties behaved poorly and they could have done better but in the end of the day whatever <laughs> so 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 did we learn much i don't know i'm just saying is that there's a lot that was done behind the scenes to try and because we knew what was coming to say like Let's see what we can do to mitigate the the damage, okay? And by the way, I think we did because it could have been a lot worse. Could have been a lot worse. Okay, but um, this person, he says, he looks at them. You sit. You did nothing. That means that you're equally as responsible. So now, Barcamsa turns from sort of like innocent bystander, hurt individual, mistaken identity to now the vengeful. I'm going to show you type. So what does he do? It gets better. I'm going to go malshin on them, which is a Talmudic term for slandering someone or telling, really giving someone over to the authorities. It's always been a healthy distrust of authorities in Jewish communities because we were always being threatened, thrown out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he says... The fact that you didn't do it, I'm going I'm to get you in trouble with the Romans. Also, I'm like the Caesar, and of course, this guy has a connect with the Caesar. He always the, the guy that you mess around with is always the guy that has like the Caesar's personal cell phone. Okay, <laughs> so he calls. So he's calling like, you know, Caesar. Oh, is this really Caesar's palace? Did he live here? No. Um, you know where that's from? No. No. Okay. Good. But my daughter-in-law's name is Caesar, so I always laugh. <laughs> Her last name. Oh, okay. <laughs> How do you spell that? S I E S S E R. Oh, it's just like like Caesar or it's like Caesar. Caesar. Okay. They should name a kid Hell. That'd be great. Um, right? Would that be great? He's the Messiah. He's not the Messiah. Yeah, Hail Caesar. That'd be a great name, Hail Caesar. Um, or they just every time they serve salad, look, we're just serving our salad. It's Caesar salad. Okay. Uh, anyway, so he's he has the, he has the Caesar's he has the Caesar's cell phone number, and he says to them, by the way, I you know I'm not I'm not one to talk, but murder Bachi the Jews are rebelling. Omolay me I'm right. He says, wow, well, who says so? What are you? They're they're going to pay the tax. They're doing fine. They're not out of line. So Omolay shadalahu kurbana, chazisi mikarvanle. I'll tell you what, why don't you send them an animal 
Let them bring it as a carbon and see if they bring it as a carbon in their holy temple. So, Azul Shadab Yodei Eglatilsa, he sent him a nice fine calf. But on the way, of course, who's escorting this calf to bring the carbon? It's Barkamsa himself. So, Bahadi the Asi, while he's going, Shadab Moma Benivs Fasayim, Armali Badukin Sivain, Shabayan. They say that he caused a shtickle blemish, a little mum, either like gave it a fat lip or something like in the eyelid, which means that the Romans, if they would send an animal that was missing a leg and the Jews said we couldn't offer it, the Romans were like, oh yeah, right, that's an imperfect animal. But a shtickle like this, for us, for our technicalities, guess what? That's, that's a mum. We can't bring it. But for the Romans, they wouldn't see that. So this guy, Barncomps, is very shrewd. Ah, I'll see. Now I'll put them in a pickle. Now, by the way, the Chazal also point out here, I think it's the, I think the Marsha also points out here that notice the types of mum, the types of blemish that are inflicted here. On the mouth or on the eyes? Speech and sight, how we view things and how we speak. Okay? So, before reading ahead, don't read ahead. You're reading ahead. I see you reading ahead. If you're the rabbis in carbon reception and you get this carbon and they say, oh, here's a carbon from the Caesar and he wants us to bring it. And the problem is, it's like, mm, would you accept it or no? Yes. Yes. Why? Back up your answer, please. <laughs> yeah, but it's against Allah. But, but Caesar sent it knowing it was fine. Yeah but, yeah, but still, the bottom line is if he, if he sent you a pig and he thought that was fine, would you bring it? No. Where's my Avdel? Yes, Gvul. <laughs> oh, yes, Gvul. So where's the Gvul? That's the question, okay? Um, now, we, Waltham, we're put in these positions where on the one hand, you have to do the right thing. On the other hand, you don't want to embarrass someone. And here, we're not talking about just embarrassing. We're talking about, you know, kind of life and death, okay? Um, like, I, I've been put in that position a lot. Again, innocuous or not, you know, we have people over for Shabbos all the time, many of whom are not Shemer Shabbat, and people with the only the kindest thoughts and goodness of their hearts, they bring something for you, but it's not kosher. Oh, yeah, yeah, chutzpah. Someone has chutzpah, they mean well, what are they, they don't know. They don't know. They don't know, they don't know. They, don't know. they saw something like, some, some, oh, something I went to, or, or let's say it's not my level of kosher. Okay. Right. Oh, I went. Epicessin. I went to Apisess, and that sounds Jewish, right? I bought you a uh, pastrami. But they brought food cut from somewhere. Where... That's fine. Cut food is fine. Oh, it is. Don't uh, yeah. fruit, cut food is fine. How light is cut fruit? Okay. Oh, um, okay. I actually once somebody brought a bottle of wine, and like when we got up to wash, and I'm like frantically. <laughs> it's not kosher. Oh my god! Like I couldn't believe, and I couldn't believe it. Like people who came, like they, I could, and I'm like. So luckily, I like Hashem Siata Dishma. I said, "Thank you so much for this." But you know, on Shabbos we only drink wine from Israel, which is true. We only drink on Shabbos. Yeah. We only drink wine from Israel. It's it. Dodge the bullet. But you know what? What happens when? Ah, okay. So sometimes you have to do the right thing, and the right thing, and actually people respect you more for that. But if it's not like life or death, they're not going to insult somebody. You know, we could figure a way to do it. So look at the rabbis. Look how they deal with this. And this goes from like. Bad to worse, really, really quickly. So, Sover Abun and Le the rabbis, they wanted to give, they, the, the, like, I guess that would be the kind of the majority position that we think. The rabbis, yeah, we should definitely bring this offering. Why? Because it says, Mishum Shlomachus. This is from the king. We're under his thumb. We don't want to upset any uh, tables and turnip barrels, whatever the expression is. Turnip, what is it? The... Apple table, apple cart, apple cart, right? Upset the apple cart. We don't want to upset the apple cart, the Roman apple cart. Okay, we don't want to mess up our Caesar salad. And you know what? Let's bring it. I, Amalur of Zachary ben Avkulis, or Zachary ben Avkulis said, Yomru bale mumum kreb l'gami mizbeach. If we bring it, then people, the people are going to say, the Jews are going to say, oh, you know what? You allow us to bring blemished animals on the mizbeach. Now, notice that there's no counter-argument here. That's always the way we have it. There's always something to say, oh, what are, what are the people going to say? Now, there are times when we have to care very much what people are going to say. And there are times when we don't care what people say. 
Okay. You have to know which to take out at the right time. Unfortunately, we tend to get that wrong on both counts, usually. <laughs> so then look what the next step is. So if the next step is, wait a minute, so maybe we could delay or something. No, no. Next thing is, several amygdala. Then they thought, wait, maybe we should just kill Barkamza. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, he'll be the car bun. Wait a minute, that 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 went off the rails really, really quickly. Wait, we're gonna kill him now because you know we don't want this to get back to the king. I mean, we can't bring a car bun, but we can murder somebody, right? Wait a minute, like I, I don't know, I don't know what the justification for this this line of reasoning is. Wait, we're worried about what people are going to say about bringing a carbon with a slight moment in, but we can kill somebody. Well, you know, of course, if it's a Malshin and he's going to get us in trouble with the Mulcha, yeah, maybe we could. It's a road day situation. Maybe, maybe, maybe. So then Rav Zahar ben Akulos, Omar Rav Zahar ben Akulos says, Yomru metal mumba kachim They're going to say, oh, if somebody brings a blemished animal, what happens? He gets murdered. So he's like, dude, pick your side. Like, which, which, you know, like, you worried about the people say this, people say about that. So the Rabbi Yochanan, then he he has the last line in this Gemara. He says, "Om Rabbi Yochanan anvesanus al shabbos zechar bein akulas." The anvesanus, the word anvesanus usually means the humility. Here, the mafarshim go to town on what this means. Some say it's sort of the obstinacy, or some say it's the um, the particularism or the uh, meticulous nature to stick to the halacha without seeing the bigger picture. That, but anvesanus, I mean. Maybe some say in an appraising way, he did it really just out of humility, like being an honest, uh, God-fearing Jew. That this, because of Rabbi Zahar ben Abkulis, because of his take on this, what happened was is that it destroyed the Beis HaMikdash and exiled us from our land, our land, our land, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the Gemara is going to go on to another, another part of the story, uh, but that that is a heck of a story, by the way. Okay, um, and the Gemara goes on to say how he sent Nero. Ba, 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 fine. Now, that's that's as far as the narrative goes. Let me let me go back to my screen. I can see everybody here. Okay, so if that's the case, if that's the case, let's go back to your question. Comps is still not in the story. Why did what did he do wrong? Why does it say because of comes What did he do? So the Marsha answers that, and also Ben Yohiyada quotes in the name of the Marsha, and he says, really, he says, I'm, I'm I'm quoting it. Look what it says. You don't have this. It says Kamsa lo avid midi. Kamsa didn't do anything. The Gemara should have said that Jerusalem was destroyed because of Bar Kamsa, not Kamsa. So some say. So he goes on to the answer that. Because he was his best friend, of course he was there. And of course he knows that his friend hates his son. And the fact that he never said anything to his friend, how do you hate my son, like you said, or the fact that he himself stood idly by without preventing this from happening. He knows that his son is at the party. He may be there also. He doesn't step in. He's also equally guilty. Okay, so sometimes even if you're not even actively involved, but you have some sort of connectivity to the issue and you do nothing about it, you could be held liable. But what's the most telling part of this, which I think is really, really what comes to the core of this issue, what the Gemara is really getting at, okay? So let's let's go over all the players again. You have Kamsa. We just determined that he has some liability. We have Bar Kamsa. He definitely has liability because even though maybe he was wronged at first, but he could have just walked away, but no, he decided he's going to become a Malshin. You have idiot messenger. You have party host. You have rabbis. Zechariah ben Avkulis, six people, six parties who all have a hand in the in the Chorban of Yerushalayim. Who is not mentioned? Going back to the original question that we asked, if you asked the eight-year-old who destroyed Jerusalem, nowhere does it say that the Romans did. In other words, we did this to ourselves. What's the Chorban of Yerushalayim? What causes real you know, exile and this and that, we do it to ourselves. Because, and that's the definition, that's what the Gemara means is about Sinas Chinam. We spend so much time with the Hak. We spend so much time, especially nowadays, and everybody's like a, a social media warrior. You can hide behind a keyboard and a screen and say whatever you want. And I mean, it's just, I, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever been, um, if you could stomach it even. So take like, 
I don't know, an average famous person. Pick any famous person. And they just innocuously post, oh yeah, I'm, I'm doing a concert in Israel or I'm visiting Israel. What a beautiful country. The amount of spurious hatred that comes in the comments is just, it's just not to be believed. Just for somebody saying that they went to Israel. And they know it's going to happen. Yeah. So, vote to those who, um, when I was in the hotel last week, my kids, it's so funny, I don't know, it's like, what do I know? My kids, like, send me a screenshot. They're like, this famous influencer is staying in your hotel. See if you can find her. I'm like, okay, I'm going to tell you two things. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to find her and I'm not going to talk to her. Um, but they told me that she, it was her first time in Israel and she got so much hatred. And she's like, I don't care about the comments. I know it's a beautiful country here. I love it. It's nice. Blah, 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 blah. But right now, and the period that we find ourselves now, not just the three weeks and the nine days, but the, the level of vitriol that exists between Jews, okay? This is what I said. This is why it was so, it was so important for me um, to go on this uh, Federation mission. It's very easy for us to say, uh, you know what? We don't really relate to the from community and it's not... Wow. I disagree with a lot of the stuff, and you know what? I just can't. We say, no, but it was, but it was very, and by the way, and it was very difficult. It's very difficult to have, you know, 500 people on a mission and, you know, less than 15 people at Shabbos lunch. You know what I'm saying? It's very hard to be in that atmosphere. And it's very hard to be, and, and, and we had more, more than five years ago, we had more Orthodox representation, but still, like, not nearly enough. And I understand, I understand. Like it's not was not inexpensive and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we have places where we want to send our dollars, et cetera. But I do think there's a value there. Now, maybe not for everybody, but for me, for in my position, I think there's a value to sit and engage with people that maybe have never seen an Orthodox person, let alone Orthodox rabbi, or never had Shabbos in Yerushalayim, and we could show them what Shabbos in Yerushalayim is. And I, I think there's a tremendous value in that. Um, and to see kind of like what real genuine Torah is and genuine Yiddishkeit is, even though they may not subscribe to it or never will or whatever, but we develop friendships through connections saying like, oh, wow, you guys aren't all crazy. <laughs> um, and I think that's why there's a tremendous value in that. And, and, and it, was, it was not easy. It was, it was very, it was, personally, it was hard for me to take at times. Um, but this is my role, okay. Um, and, and I think that, and I just kept coming back to this Gemara, that if we could find ways to bridge communities, even in very, very small ways, and to say, therefore, when something happens, to say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to stick up for my Orthodox friend, or I'm going to stick up for my Reform friend, uh, because that's not what you think. And when we have these big episodes like this, we have ways that we could channel conversation so they don't blow up into bigger, bigger things, which is what the world has become today. Nothing is what it seems. Because it's 11 long year, okay? So that this is hard. So because it's 11 long year, beautiful sneeze. Um, <laughs> the, the, this is part one. Next week, we're going to look at a different episode, which comes later in the Gemara. So I'll take these back and, and I'll hold on to until next week. But another episode, the episode of Yochanan ben Zakkai, actually during the Chorban itself, and how he single-handedly saves Yiddishkeit and he saves Torah Judaism. We'll see what he does. Um, really, really fascinating. So um, so we have this we have today, we have next week, and then uh, everybody will uh, enjoy, enjoy Chorban of August. So, but uh, great to see everybody. Great to be back, really. And uh, thank you so much for joining and I will send this out the uh, recording later. Yeah. I'm looking outside Mabul. I know it's like right now. It's just about yeah, just turn like that. So I don't know. No one, no one. Came a Thank you.